Welcome everyone. My name is Daphne Stavropoulos and I'm today's moderator. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center's briefing with JP Morgan on the global economic outlook. Please keep your microphone muted until you're called on to ask a question. If you have technical problems during the briefing, you can use the chat feature and we will try to assist you. As a reminder of today's ground rules, this briefing is on the record. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our briefer, Mr. Bruce Kasman. He's a managing director and chief economist at JP Morgan. This briefing is an opportunity to hear Mr. Kasman's analysis and insights excuse me, on the global economy and prospects for global recovery post COVID-19. He will discuss foreign governments and central banks efforts to offer unprecedented stimulus in order to stimulate economies and markets. And as a reminder, our briefers opinions are his own and don't represent those of the US government. Mr. Kasman will make some opening remarks and then I will open our meeting for questions and answers. Mr. That, excuse me, <laughs> and with that, Mr. Kasman, please go ahead and welcome. Okay, thank you and uh, thank you, Daphne, and thank you to all participating. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is give you a sense of how we're putting the world together. Uh, try to keep uh, my comments uh, to some key points that give you a sense of how we're uh, thinking the key moving and building blocks of the world are, and then allow for the conversation to go in whatever direction is uh, most important to you. Uh, in terms of the way we're putting the story together, and by the way, there is a chart book which was sent around. I might refer to that for a couple of uh, uh, exhibits, but certainly you don't need that to get across, to get to what I'm going to be saying here. Um, and as I start, I want to just make three basic points about how we put the outlook together. Uh, the first and uh, uh, most obvious one, because I think we're seeing it already, is that we're in the midst of a of a historic uh, move down in activity as a result of the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, um, uh, shock. It is in our mind going to be the deepest move down in activity uh, that we have seen at least since World War II globally. And it's pretty similar in terms of the view as we look at it uh, across uh, countries. Uh, for those of you who have the chart book in front of you, you can see the uh, chart on page uh, uh, six, I believe, of the chart book, um, with five, excuse me, which shows you uh, the annual growth in 2020 in a historical perspective. And you can see again, as I said a minute ago, uh, deeper than anything we've seen uh, since World War II, one of the three or four deepest events in terms of the decline in activity that's taken place over the last century. Uh, at the same time that it's going to be deep, we also believe it's going to be very short-lived. And we're looking for growth rates in the second half of the year, which are also unprecedented in terms of the uh, lifting coming out of a recovery. Globally, uh, we have growth rates running uh, between 15 and 20 percent annualized. That comes after similar size declines in terms of growth rate uh, during the first half of the year. Uh, I want to talk in a minute about why we're going to get that lift, but I want to get the third point out um, also, which is uh, that the uh, extent of the uh, recovery is going to be partial. And what we are looking for is a deep downturn, a quick and very strong recovery, but a partial recovery that leaves us with a lot of damage in the global economy that's lasting. To put a number on that, um, to start, if those of you have the chart book, I uh, want to look at it on page nine. Uh, the re key reference point we're using is where the level of GDP is versus the path we had predicted uh, before the virus came on the scene. Uh, for the global economy, that's a loss of about 5% uh, of GDP at the end of this year. It only declines to uh, something a touch below 4% at the end of uh, next year. And therefore, uh, we're in the midst of an event which in terms of unemployment, in terms of income loss, uh, in terms of the levels of GDP, uh, continues to linger here for some time. Uh, now, what I want to do beyond the obvious, which is that this um, event in terms of the disruptions that came from containment measures has produced a big downturn, is argue why we can get a big bounce and then also why the bounce is likely to be partial and not bring us all the way back. On the reasons for getting the big bounce, one of which I think we can see already, which is that containment measures have been successful and they are now producing a relaxation in activity. We saw it already well underway in China 
Uh, and in China, you can see in the March and April activity readings some fairly strong results. Uh, the uh, openings have begun in Western Europe, uh, in the Americas, uh, and we think um, the recovery broad base will be underway globally before uh, the middle part of this year. Uh, what the China data is telling you, and I think it's important, is that from very depressed starting points and activity, small changes in terms of uh, um, the containment measures can give you big initial uh, rebounds and growth. Uh, we also think that you're getting this rebound because of the fact that the Fed, other central banks, and policymakers more broadly have done a very good job limiting the magnification of the damage uh, to financial markets. Credit markets continue to function. Credit is actually growing at a rapid pace in the U.S. and Western Europe. Emerging market economies are seeing capital continue to flow in. These are things which could have turned out far worse if policy hadn't stepped in and done quite a good job of limiting these magnification effects. Uh, the third reason to expect rebound is because we've gotten the stimulus that we have. It's our estimate that the fiscal stimulus we're getting globally for this year is going to be exceeding 3% of GDP. Uh, to put that in context, uh, the stimulus we got after the global financial crisis in 2009 is by our estimates about a percentage point less than that. So there's a huge stimulus. Uh, there's been success in containing the crisis to not hit financial markets, and we've succeeded in putting ourselves in a place for starting to relax. Those are the catalysts, that's the recipe for getting this big initial lift. What is the reason why the lift doesn't take us all the way back? Well, again, I want to emphasize three things here. Uh, the first is that the virus is contained. The virus is uh, going to start to uh, uh, gradually move out of the frame, but it's not going to go away. Uh, we don't have a vaccine. Certainly we might get one, but that's not built into our baseline forecast. Uh, we're also not building in a big second wave outbreak, but we do look at the world as having to deal with the virus uh, in terms of uh, some containment measures, in terms of consumer uh, fears that's lasting for some time. So activity, behavior, not going back completely to normal. The second issue here, and I think it's the biggest one, is that there are big income losses that are taking place right now. Even though the event is short-lived, the income losses in terms of people losing their job, in terms of corporate profits going down, these are very big. They're going to create damage to balance sheets. They're going to create damage not only on the private sector balance sheet, but also on the public sector side uh, to support those. And those um, impacts are going to have a lasting effect on behavior. Uh, one point we try to make uh, in our research is how different it's going to be for the household sector as opposed to the corporate sector. Uh, we do believe a lot of the supports that you're getting from governments are coming in the form of enhanced unemployment benefits or wage subsidies or uh, checks as we're doing in the United States. Uh, these are things which are giving the household sector uh, a lot of income cushion through the bad time here. Um, that is going to be quite positive in terms of sparking the initial leg of the recovery, but both because of the caution I described a few minutes ago from behavior, as well as what we believe is going to be ongoing concern on the household sector side, particularly in places like the U.S. where labor markets have gotten hit so hard about uh, job insecurity. Uh, we don't think the multiplier of those income supports are going to be um, all that great. Uh, that's why we think the household savings rate in the United States, which we're expecting to get up on Friday in the April uh, income report uh, towards 25%, is not going to come fully back down to the about 7% level it was uh, at the start of this year. Um, in addition, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, while the household sector is being supported by income transfers, the corporate sector, firms more generally, are being supported by credit. Uh, what you're seeing in terms of the way that governments are helping corporates uh, is through some combination of government guarantee loans or easier access to lending through a whole host of different schemes. And that's really important for bridging the cash flow gap that uh, takes place here through the bad times. But the loss of income is not being reversed. The rise in credit is not going away on corporate balance sheets. 
And as we go into this expansion, we will have saved a wave of bankruptcies during the crisis, but we will leave the corporate sector in less strong position to drive a recovery. And that is, in our mind, going to be an ongoing and somewhat lingering drag. Uh, the third point here is, I think, policy fatigue. Uh, fatigue may not be the right word, but there's enormous amount of stimulus that's being put in place right now. It's being designed to handle an emergency. Uh, the stimulus is not designed to last beyond this year in almost every case. And in order to not have a very large fiscal drag in 2021, you're going to need to see active policies uh, to extend these. Uh, some of that will happen. Uh, we do expect more stimulus to come in the United States. In fact, we're looking for another trillion dollars of stimulus uh, through packages that are still being debated in Washington. Uh, we expect more stimulus to come elsewhere as well, but not enough to prevent through 2021 fiscal policy to be fading in its supports and fading in its supports in a way that does provide a, a drag on growth. Uh, the interesting difference, I think, between the US and Western Europe is, is worth noting in this regard where Europe is providing its supports through stimulus to the labor market by helping people stay in jobs. The U.S. is allowing for the traditional flexibilities of the labor market to operate. That's why we will have another very ugly employment report with millions of people losing their job when the May reading comes out a week from Friday, uh, and probably an unemployment rate that goes up closer to 20 percent. Um, but um, at the same time, those things create different dynamics going forward. The U.S. tends to have more dynamism in terms of the, the lifting out of recessions because of that. Um, the Europeans tend to have weaker uh, uh, lifts, partly because corporates are still holding all of that labor cost on their books, and we're having the balance sheet uh, dynamic that we talked about a minute ago. So it's an interesting contrast of systems. Uh, from our point of view, the U.S. gets hurt more initially in labor markets, uh, comes back quicker. Right now, we're not distinguishing in a significant way the amount of damage being done to the two economies when looked at over uh, an 18-month period, but it's an important test. It's something worth watching. Uh, the last couple of things I want to talk about are first, inflation, where uh, there is both demand and supply dynamics which are at work here. Uh, there is disruptions to supply chain. There are cost increases that are going to be required across a number of sectors to deal with the healthcare problems that are going to be ongoing. That's going to feed some price increases. But in our mind, the bigger effect here on inflation is going to be the um, ongoing weakness in demand, the loss in output that we talked about earlier. Uh, output gaps are going to be pretty similar to those GDP losses we talked about. Uh, we have an output gap of a little over 3% for the global economy at the end of next year. That's a huge amount of slack that's going to weigh on pricing. And particularly in our mind, in the services industries, which generally don't see pricing move, but are being specifically affected um, by this event. The final thing I want to just emphasize is that anytime you go through a crisis, it, it has repercussions through the political process. It is, I think, something that an economist like myself would probably be uh, uh, careful to be humble in terms of our ability to forecast what happens on the political side. I would note that after the global financial crisis, there were a combination of political dynamics which helped, um, it, which hindered the, the recovery and, and it helped contribute to what was a very subpar decade. Uh, how politics responds to this crisis, I think is, um, is a big factor for what we're gonna see uh, in terms of the ongoing and longer term effects of this. I would note in that regard that it's encouraging to see uh, the announcements last week by Merkel and Macron to talk about a European recovery fund, uh, which starts to deal with some of the issues around burden sharing in the region, which certainly is going to build pressure here, and also starts to deal with some of the institutional uh, problems you have in Europe where you don't have a common um, fiscal authority to deal with shocks of this nature. Uh, at the same time, I think there are other things to be concerned about, uh, US-China relations being one, uh, the Brexit negotiations being another, uh, and, and there are a whole host of things we can talk about related to the lack of coordination going on on a global uh, level. Uh, so with that, I will um, 
I'll stop here and see uh, if we can get a conversation going. Happy to take your questions or also hear, hear your comments if you want to uh, express any. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your opening remarks. Um, and let's open the rest of the hour to questions and answers. I'm going to uh, call on those who are participating uh, via Zoom online, and then I will turn to those who called in. For those uh, joining online, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of the participant list, or indicate you have a question via the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, and I will call on you. And as a courtesy to our briefer, please provide your full name and your outlet before stating your question. Uh, let's go to Pearl. Go ahead, Pearl. Um, Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, this is Pearl, Open Parliament, uh, covering SADC region. Um, Bruce, obviously, as the Managing Director for JP Morgan Chase, you have a pretty good out outlook on the whole, on the whole world. Right. So my concern is, for instance, I believe today ExxonMobil and any uh, are announcing that they are pulling out out of the um, projects there right off the coast of Mozambique. Um, and I'm, maybe South Africa is concerned about the downgrading. Uh, how do you see that whole SADC region, the Southern African region? And I mentioned specifically South Africa, Mozambique, Zambia, Botswana some of the fragile economies like Zimbabwe? Do you have any concerns about countries printing money, uh, whereas other advanced economies are able to pull up these uh, stimulus packages? And specifically these countries because they're interconnected. You've got some that are landlocked that have um, freight, freight routes, for instance, that South Africa relies on. How do you see that part of the world uh, panning out the rest of the year and into 2021? So, um let me say first off that in terms of the coverage and my focus, um, we cover South Africa, but we don't have extensive coverage through the rest of the region. So I can talk a little bit about the region, but not with a, a great degree, degree of expertise. And I can point you to our, our regional um, uh, coverage for some more detail if you want on that. Um, I think that there's a um, sort of a common factor playing out here and some un that, that's common to most of EM and much of the rest of the world. And then there are some specific things about South Africa that we have to consider. I think the common factor is the, the, the pressure that's being put on governments here to react and the, um, the fact that they are reacting, SARB is easing, we're getting some fiscal stimulus. Uh, we are seeing uh, the virus begin to get contained, although to different degrees in different, in different places. And we think it does offer the opportunity uh, for growth to come back in the second half of the year. But one of the factors that's that's definitely the case in Southern Africa, South Africa specifically, uh, and is true of other, other emerging market economies, is they don't have the capacity uh, to deal with these uh, shocks, uh, not only the shock of having to um, uh, deal with the crisis directly, but also the indirect loss in terms of uh, economic uh, um, uh, factors such as income, um, and profits on the part of companies. And that's a specific issue that I think has created some stress in markets, as you noted, has created a, a risk of downgrades. Uh, and I don't think it's easy to get a, away from the fact that some of the, uh, the lingering drags that we talked about before, even if we get past the crisis, are going to be difficult and specific for that part of the world. So for uh, South Africa, for example, we have a larger cumulative output loss than that um, uh, three and a half to four percent number that I mentioned to you globally. Uh, what we do feel is actually an encouraging thing that's happening here um, is the fact that not only are uh, central banks in emerging market economies, even those that have some stress in their financial uh, stability issues, they are continuing to ease. And also they are going on the route of supporting uh, government finances by helping to fund them through purchases of government securities, either directly or indirectly. We've been uh, believing that that's an important step that needs to take place here. I think on the broader point, and I'm not going to speak to this specifically because we haven't, I think, articulated strong views on there, there is a burden sharing issue here that requires coordination among the G20, among the IMF, uh, and the countries which have been hit hardest here because otherwise, 
I think on an ongoing basis, some of these lingering drags uh, could turn into more severe uh, financial stress points. Great. Well, thank you so much. Let's next go to um, Paolo. Paolo, can you introduce yourself and your outlet? Paolo, do you have a question that you'd like to ask Mr. Kasman? Okay. We'll go on to um, John, John Beers, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great, great. Thank you. Um, John Beers with Agence France Press. Um, my question is, uh, we've um, obviously seen a lot of job cuts in the United States already. Um, with these each week, the weekly jobless claims, you know, are really high and disturbing. Um, there's a set number of sectors that have already sort of talked about cutting, you know, signaling that they're probably going to cut jobs in a matter of months as well, like in the airline sector, as well as in, I think, retailers as well, because there've been all these bankruptcies that have come in the last few weeks even. What kind of, um, where do you see the jobless claims um, and the, like, how do you see employment and unemployment trending over the next months in the United States? I mean, do you think we're going to just see, um, like, one or two million jobless claims for months and months? Or do you think, obviously, some people will get rehired at a certain point, but how do you, how do you see that? Can you just talk about the rest of the year, how do you see the un unemployment and unemployment picture in the United States? So we don't have a explicit forecast for jobless claims going forward, but we do have explicit forecasts for GDP, for uh, employment and the unemployment rate. So let me just make sure I'm gonna pull this up in front of me so I don't uh, misstate anything. So for example, we have the US um, unemployment rate getting up to a peak sometime next week. Uh, we haven't formalized a, a forecast for next week, but I'll just say somewhere closer to 20% to where we were with the 14 um, and a half percent or so level we had um, in April. So another significant move up here with another very significant loss in jobs. I would think somewhere more than 5 million jobs get lost in the month of May. Um, but as I was saying earlier, we do see a very quick turnaround in the economy. And we are looking for, um, in a world in which we will have lost something in the range of 25 million jobs or so over the course of um, March, April, May, we look to see roughly six or seven million jobs created in the third quarter of the year as people come back to work. As you can do the math on that, that's not a complete reversal. Uh, it's not one which brings the unemployment rate back down. We have the unemployment rate in the United States still standing at the end of this year at about 11%, uh, but the move from 20 or so to 11 is a huge move down. And that's the nature of the beast here. We think there's a lot that you can get through the relaxations in terms of turning things around here. But for the reasons I discussed earlier, uh, we don't think you're going to have a full recovery. And to sit here at the end of this year with a 10% unemployment rate is going to be a serious problem for the U.S., particularly as we continue to see only a gradual uh, recovery into 2021. The Labor market is not the only part of this story. Uh, as you referenced, there will be bankruptcies. We've saved a lot of bankruptcies through policy supports uh, immediately, but we've done so at the expense of leaving corporate balance sheets uh, in a more vulnerable position. And the work out of that is going to take place over time and is going to be uh, a significant drag on growth. Uh, so, you know, things I think can come back very quickly from very depressed levels but not completely. And I think that's going to be uh, the nature of what we are experiencing in the second half of the year in the United States and pretty much across the globe, if we're right. Well, thank you very much. Um, the next question is, goes to Nikki. Nikki, please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Kasman. This is Nikki Natarajan or Nikki from Indo-Asian News Service. I just wanted your outlook on India. Thank you. Well, again, I'm going to be at the, at, the, at the sort of the tension between my um, lack of expertise as an Indian specialist and our common features that we have to the 
uh, general outlook as we look at the, at the global economy. Um, we're of the mind that um, India is going to be um, going through a very difficult first half of the year. We have GDP down in the um, second quarter at 35% annualized pace, uh, but we have a very strong rebound in the second half of the year, uh, but one that still doesn't get you back to where you were. Uh, we are worried significantly about the deterioration in public finances. Uh, we think the RBI is now uh, almost done, but not completely done with the easing that it is going to be uh, doing here. We have a bottom in the policy rate uh, forecast, uh, very close to where we are now at 375. Um, and um, I, you know, I think the issues in terms of the stresses on public finances, the stress of having had huge um, social disruptions through this event are going to be difficult ones to forecast and think about how they're going to linger. As I said, for South Africa, I think it's also true uh, for India that there's going to be needed support from the central bank in helping to fund what we expect to be pretty large uh, ongoing budget deficits here. Um, and I think the hope is that you can get through this without Are you connected? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, so you were talking about the situation in Europe and what uh, Merkel and Macron are discussing. Uh, of course, Italy is one of the countries that is in a, uh, most uh, difficulties at, at this point. There is also a discussion whether these uh, funds that Merkel and Macron are talking about should be grants or loan, do you think are sufficient? And do you think Italy should accept it no matter what, whether they are grants or loans? So I think there's two different pieces to this. One is the uh, opportunity to take advantage of the ESM, which is clearly going to be a loan. Uh, and we are expecting Italy to take, take, take that up um, roughly at a size, um, I don't know the number in euros, but it's about 2% of your Italian GDP. Um, and we are looking to see, with obviously a lot of uncertainty about the details, this uh, uh, recovery fund get launched over the next year or two and provide grants that will be available to Italy. Um, I'm not sure of the size because the five per 500 billion euro plan will so almost certainly be, be whittled down somewhat in the negotiations. Um, that leaves Italy struggling here as it was already. Uh, with a higher burden. I don't think this is the end of the story in terms of how Europe deals with its burden sharing, but I do think we're seeing enough supports both with lending and with these uh, grants that are going to come through. And of course, we don't want to ignore the ECB's continued willingness through the PEPP program, which is in our mind going to be doubled um, probably at the next uh, uh, ECB meeting uh, to make it through without a, a more a significant source of stress, unless Italian politics turns more seriously um, uh, disruptive, which is which is not our forecast. But there's, you know, one of the points I think that's coming across with these questions is we do believe we are getting enough cushions, enough supports to deal with the um, immediate issue to not only allow uh, countries to avoid a crisis in terms of financial stress over the next few months, but to be able to start getting on a recovery path in the second half of the year. But there are unanswered questions here about more medium term um, ability to fund, ability to grow, um, and what kind of stresses show up in financial markets. And some of that is the nature of the shock in terms of how big uh, income loss it is. And some of it is um, the unanswered questions about how um, institutions, regional and global, are going to deal with the uneven burden, and there is an uneven burden on um, Italy within the um, European Monetary Union. There's an un un uneven burden around poor uh, countries around the world, countries which are, haven't uh, been as capable in terms of uh, 
uh, putting in place the cushions to deal with this. And you could put, point to South Africa and India in, in those cases. And we don't have a good answer to the question of how do these uh, forces play themselves out over a horizon of one, two, three years here, other than to make the point that it contributes to our concerns about the difficulty of getting back uh, to what we thought was normal uh, in terms of economic uh, performance uh, before this uh, crisis hit. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is going to go to Weir. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Kessman. Uh, I had two questions. Uh, one is, uh, what is the consequence of uh, um, Federal Reserve and uh, Federal Government lavishing their power to support uh, the economy? Uh, like uh, this, the current market rally is a result of all the liquidation put out to the market. Uh, also, your viewpoint on the negative interest rate. And the second uh, question is your expectation uh, or observation for the recovery of China's economy. Thank you. We are please just give your media outlet. Oh, yeah. uh, this is where with China Business Network. Thank you. So um, let me deal with the Fed question first. Um, you know, we do believe, as I said earlier, that the actions that the Fed has taken and other central banks as well have been critical in preventing the COVID-19 shock, which has been enormous, from magnifying on itself by uh, creating an environment where uh, markets uh, stop functioning, where credit markets seized up. Um, that would have made this much more damaging and much longer lasting. And we think that the steps the Fed has taken, the multiple um, programs it's, it's in, implemented to support uh, credit, to support dollar funding globally, uh, and has been backed up by the Treasury in some cases have been quite, quite important and quite amazing in terms of how broadly it has uh, expanded its operations. And we can see this in terms of the Fed balance sheet, which we think will, by the end of the, uh, uh, process of using these facilities will have been roughly double where it was um, when the crisis started. It will, in our mind, get up to something in the range of close to eight and a half trillion uh, U.S. dollars. Uh, that I think is really important, but it does have consequences which, going forward, um, raise some issues for the economy, including um, the fact that many of these programs are temporary in nature and they will unwind. That's the fatigue factor we talked about earlier. Um, in addition, the consequences of Fed taking a more active role in credit allocation in the economy is, is unclear in terms of what that's going to mean um, going forward. Um, and of course, the uh, big issue, which is starting to be thought about from both the Fed and other central bank, is how do you deal with the demand weakness that we expect to persist, holding back inflation, in terms of trying to achieve your macroeconomic goals when you are already at a zero interest rate policy. As you asked in your question about negative interest rates, uh, the Fed has effectively ruled that out anytime soon. And uh, we do not think that at least over the next 18 months, that's likely to be the Fed's choice to deal with the more medium term challenges it's gonna face. Uh, we think it's more likely that the Fed will use a uh, fairly aggressive forward guidance to signal its commitment to trying to get inflation back up. Uh, it might further expand its QE programs, and it could, although it's not our current forecast as a baseline, it could go to something like the Japanese yield control um, uh, targets, although if the Fed does that, we think they'll stay much shorter on the curve. Um, with the Chinese economy question, um, you know, we do believe that China was very aggressive and successful in containing the crisis. Uh, it has, in that sense, done a, uh, a good job in putting itself in a position for being the first out in terms of generating recovery. And it does look to us that it's been impressive here so far how well they have gotten that initial uh, step towards stronger activity. Uh, the labor market, I think, is, is a key ongoing concern here, getting people back to work, but the numbers there are starting to turn as well. And we think uh, the government, as you saw last week with the NPC, having delivered another leg of fiscal stimulus, there's more on the way. Um, I think China's issues here going forward 
uh, beyond the uh, control of the virus is going to be that it's going to face a very significant external drag from the rest of the world, uh, both being weak in the second quarter and not having a full recovery beyond that. And it faces the the challenges of a different environment in terms of how supply chains are evolving here and how the political process is evolving in terms of Chinese companies' um, uh, operations around the world. Um, we do have a partial recovery in China as, as we do everywhere else. Um, and we do have um, unanswered questions about how balance sheets have been affected uh, in China, perhaps the public sector one being uh, one of the more interesting uh, parts of that uh, equation where we have the consolidated fiscal position in our estimate having a deficit this year of something between 13 and 14 percent of GDP. Yes. Uh, in terms of the uh, the market rally, is this? Do you think um, it is also a result of uh, the the federal governments or the Federal Reserve's uh, all the liquidations? Yeah. So I'm not a market strategist. So the last thing I'm going to comment on is valuations in markets. But I don't think there's any doubt um, that the success in in containing um, market structure, structuring pressures, the ability of the Fed and other central banks to keep credit markets opening, to keep credit flowing uh, to emerging markets is a huge part of the reason why uh, equity markets have done as well as they have. Uh, I think there is a separate issue here relative to past recessions that while the move down here has been dramatic and it has um, been unprecedented, it's also a very different type of an event than in 2008, 2009 or past recessions where the man-made nature of this event that we have shut things off and we can turn things on, I think has given markets greater confidence in seeing um, the recovery ahead, at least its initial stages, as we've described. And that optimism combined with the supports from policymakers has held um, the weakness in markets at bay to some degree relative to what we've seen um, at a similar point in past global recessions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question goes to Martin. Martin, please go ahead. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Martin Burkhardt. I work for a newspaper in Denmark. I'm the American correspondent, and the name is Informa Schoen. Mr. Kasman, um, two questions. The first one about federal debt or, and federal deficit as a drag on economic growth, and the second one on the V-shape versus the U-shape recovery. The first question is um, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff in, I think, 2014-15 wrote this essay about, um, you know, a federal debt when it reaches about 80 or 90 percent of GDP, it starts being a drag on growth. And it was, you know, it was pointed out by a student at UMass Amherst at that time, there was a calculation error, but the dispute has never really been resolved and we're going to end up. Uh, I think by the end of this year, with a, um, a debt that's close to 140, 150% of GDP, so that's like uh, higher than the Italian one is at the moment before going into this pand uh, pandemic. So I wonder whether you um, share that view that Rogoff and, and Reinhardt put forth at that time. And the second question is um, your V-shape um, recovery forecast, like all forecasts, especially on pandemics and death rates, it depends on the presumptions you put into your mathematical model. And I wonder whether uh, not putting a second wave in there is a, is a realistic scenario. And secondly, I wonder whether you thought of what might be the economic policy of a Biden administration that has an impact on your 2021 forecast. Um, the Biden administration would uh, possibly try to raise uh, wages, uh, uh, you know, minimum wage. Uh, they would do probably a number of other things that might be seen by uh, both Wall Street and the business world as being a drag on economic growth. That's it. Sorry for being too long. No. So on the first uh, point, um, there's no doubt we're getting fairly significant increases in public sector debt across the the world. And um, I think there's no doubt that this is necessary as part of the uh, uh, process of containing 
uh, the immediate um, crisis and making sure that the um, the economic losses that are being created by the containment measures themselves don't spill over into much deeper and broader uh, economic uh, uh, disruptions. I do believe there are nonlinearities in the macroeconomic world and policy's job is partly to prevent those nonlinearities from taking hold and putting us into much worse situations. And I think this is the circumstances we're in now. And if we're right, we will get significant dividends from that in terms of the initial boost to growth that comes from the uh, relaxation of these uh, uh, measures. And I think we're starting to see that. I think we have seen uh, for a couple of months now, the initial phases in China moving in that direction. And I'm pretty hopeful that we will see that in Western Europe and in the Americas start to take place uh, over the next couple of months. The business surveys we've seen for May, including PMIs, including the IFO in Germany, are, are certainly um, pointing in that direction. And I'm comfortable with that. Um, I do believe, as you're noting, that there are consequences to building up public sector debt. I don't believe there's any magic number and certainly not a number which points to crisis uh, on the side of having higher public sector debt. I think countries like the United States, countries like Denmark, countries like Germany, uh, most of the advanced economies have a huge capacity to fund and finance debt, debt and deficit. And in a world in which global interest rates, risk-free interest rates are so low, there's very little pressure on that that I think we need to worry about in the near term. Now, um, that doesn't mean that this isn't a cost because I think what we're doing here is we are taking those uh, degrees of fiscal flexibility that was hoped to be used for investments, uh, perhaps for climate change, perhaps for education infrastructure, and we're using it to fight the virus. And that is going to, I think, cause um, trade-offs down the road, which are going to lead um, to less being done on these other fronts. Uh, in addition, I think there will be a point at which slack gets eaten up in the world and risk-free interest rates go up and borrowing costs go up. And there will be at that point a very important choice central banks will have to make, uh, which is part of the broader public policy choice, which is to what degree um, do they play an active and ongoing role in terms of funding government deficits. I think they are doing so now in a world in which they're not constrained because inflation is low and they're trying to um, support growth. But at some point here, the, the choices won't be as, as easy. But I'm not worried over a horizon of two years about the costs and those trade-offs, other than what I see having been given up as we think about what could have been done on the public finance side and what will be a cost somewhat down the road. These are not costless investments. They're necessary investments. Um, but they're not investments, which I think, at least in the advanced economies, are going to cause the stress points over the next couple of years, notwithstanding the issues we talked about earlier with regard to the uh, absence of burden sharing in Europe and some of the weaker countries like Italy and, and in EM, where I think there are more uh, potential immediate pressure points coming um, from the um, uh, fiscal side. Um, then you asked me about um, policy and Joe Biden and the future. And I'll say this. V-shaped. Oh, V-shaped. Well, yeah. in our forecast, I think I said this already, we have V-shape in terms of growth and we have something more akin to U-shape in terms of levels of GDP. And I think it's very careful when you talk about these things that they both matter, but probably the more important one over a longer period of time is the levels. Um, you know, if you go down... 50% and then you grow 50% afterwards, you're not at the same place. In fact, you're quite a bit ways different. So when you draw that chart and you just look at growth rates, it looks like a V, but it's not a V in terms of the level of activity. So um, I'm, I tend to shy away from using letters because I think it can be very misleading. But if we have to tie it down, I think we have a, a path in our forecast, which has a V shape in growth rates and a U shape in levels of GDP. And as I said, I think the levels matter an awful lot more uh, than the growth rate numbers, even though when you're living through it, you tend to be very tied to the growth rate, partly because you're thinking that what your growth rate is now might be able to be extrapolated. Um, so going on to policy, I don't think there's any doubt, and I think there's an, there's an 
underpinning of everything that um, uh, I'm saying that depends on the, the path of the virus and depends on the path of policy. And you're 100% right. We live in the world and as we need to in expressing modal views. And there's a huge range of, of both inputs to that that could be playing out differently, um, as well as uh, alternative scenarios that could be driven. But our modal view that builds in a partial recovery is not being very confident or specific about paths ahead, either from the point of view of the virus or from the point of view of policy. But what I said up front, I think is important. There's two things that are being built into the forecast explicitly. One is that the virus isn't going away. So while I'm not building in a, a second wave, I'm also not building in a complete removal of the virus from our day-to-day -day life. So it is a, a force that drags, and we may be underestimating that. There may be a second wave, but we're not going to the point of thinking that it's, um, it's gone from the scene. And that is embedded uh, to different degrees and different, you know, one of the things about forecasting is I have 32 economists working for me they're not all using exactly the same assumptions on these things, even though we try to work in a common, in a common framework. And, and similarly on the political side, there's not a explicit forecast for who's going to win the U S election. And the last thing I would want to do is try to predict that. Um, there's not a specific forecast by whether the winner is going to control the two houses of Congress, which is hugely important for getting an agenda uh, passed. And there's certainly not a specific forecast for, the policies themselves that may come. But what is built into our forecast is that the extraordinary stimulus that's in place now, and this is a forecast which is true not just for the US, uh, does have the backside of fatigue and fading, which actually turns into a drag on growth sometime in 2021. And if you want to magnify that through active policies as opposed to just the passive allowing of things to unwind, you could get more negative uh, scenarios. But basically what's built in is the virus continues to be something of a drag and perhaps as much on cautious behavior as it is in terms of specifics around the outbreak and that there is a drag that comes from uh, government policies turning um, less supportive and in fact allowing things to unwind. And I'm comfortable with those things without again trying to get too too precise and recognizing as you're noting that there are alternatives that could could drive these things far, far further in a negative direction than we uh, we even have in our baseline forecast. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a number of questions remaining, and our time is limited. So I'd ask everyone a call on to limit uh, themselves to one question. With that, we'll go ahead to uh, Momo. Please introduce yourself and your outlet. Hi, Mr. Kassman. Um, my name is Momoe Ban. I'm with Nikkei newspaper, Japanese business newspaper. And thank you very much for this great presentation. My question is about state and local government financial situation. Mm -hmm. um, National Governors Association led by uh, Governor Cuomo is now demanding more federal financial assist assistance. And uh, House passed the additional stimulus plan, including this uh, assistance to gov uh, local and state and local government. But I was wondering, how do you expect um, those financial difficulties of state and local government will impact overall economy and financial markets? So I think, you know, one of the recurring themes of this conversation is burden sharing. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about it with regard to Italy. We've talked about it with regard to the need for supports for EM economies. And now we're talking about it within the United States where there's um, undue pressure being placed on certain states and more generally state and local um, uh, finances. And that is a uh, problem that we're gonna have to deal with going forward. Embedded in our forecast for the United States is an additional $1 trillion of stimulus that has not yet been uh, legislated. Uh, we don't have a specific timetable in our forecast, and we don't even have a, a very articulate mix of where the, the money will go to, but some of it will go to state and local governments. Some of it will go to increasing the lending programs or extending the lending programs, and some of it will go to um, benefits for the um, 
the household sector being extended, particularly the unemployment uh, benefits. Uh, that will alleviate some of the pressure, but not all of the pressure. Uh, there is, I think, part of the story on the U.S. next year is that state and local governments come under some pressure and become uh, a part of that fiscal tightening that we talked about earlier, and therefore part of the uh, incomplete uh, recovery story. Um, the risk, of course, is that you get less from uh, policy and, and Washington, and you have more pressure and ultimately, there is a risk, which we're not building into our forecast in any clear way, that there could be a states or localities that come under severe enough pressure that they have uh, to restructure or do something of that like. But that is a pressure point. Directionally, it's, it's built into our forecast. We need more, I think, fiscal action from Washington to just validate our baseline forecast. But the bias is that over time, state and local authorities come under pressure on our drag on U.S. growth. Thank you. Elena, you're up next. Hello, thank you so much for um, uh, for, for this briefing. Oh, I had a couple questions about Brazil. I'm from the Portuguese news agency, by the way. So in the chart of the global economic outlook summary that you provided, and I thank you for that, Brazil has one of the highest drops in real GDP in the second quarter of this year, but 67% of growth in the third quarter. So. Why? Why is that? And also the foreign investment in Brazil has dropped to numbers that are the lowest in 25 years. How would you explain that? Well, I think part of the Brazil story, if, I've, um, if I'm going to articulate it here, is that they moved somewhat later. They're having a more serious trouble dealing with containing uh, the crisis. And that combined with some of the domestic political stress points uh, is putting pressure on financial markets in Brazil, which is reinforcing that. Um, so all of that together, uh, even with the, um, the central bank easing, um, is creating more downward pressure. And if I, and I, I want to just open the table myself to see that, I think um, in addition, what you're getting um, is a less complete bounce from Brazil. If, I've, if I got my numbers right and I have to go to a spreadsheet here to see it, I think the kinds of uh, um, recovery we have in Brazil is generally, yeah, it's definitely among the worst performers in terms of the recovery. Um, our forecast has Brazil sitting relative to an overall global forecast where we're close to 4% below um, the pre-crisis level of GDP at the end of next year. We're closer to 7% in Brazil. So that's a significant underperformance. And I think, again, it's a reflection of... Uh, uh, the inability to quickly bring the crisis, the, the virus under control, uh, combined with the stresses we we see playing out in terms of tightening financial conditions in the in the economy. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Great. Uh, the next question goes to um, Ozzy. Ozzy, please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Ozzy Ying from Taiwan Central News Agency. Uh, my question is about Taiwan. Uh, the outlook, uh, the outbreak itself has limited impact on Taiwan so far, but its export-driven economy looks to be suffering due to muted external demand compared to pre-crisis level. And JP Morgan predicts there will be nearly no growth for Taiwan's economy this year. And what's your take on that? Well, our take is that, China, that Taiwan is doing pretty darn good relatively. That's the the message. Uh, obviously, as you say, we have no growth, but if you look at Taiwan versus the rest of the world, um, we are basically seeing a much uh, smaller decline in activity and a recovery that brings you much closer back to normal than just about any other place in the world. And I think that both speaks to the success in containing the virus quickly, um, but it also speaks to Taiwan's, I think, uh, position here benefiting in the tech sector from what is a very significant rotation in demand uh, to completing 5G networks, uh, to putting in place more work at home um, electronics. Um, and you're seeing that in the data, as you noted, Taiwan is experiencing weakness in its exports overall, but not severe weakness. And that's because while the non-tech uh, sector is getting hurt really badly, the tech sector is actually doing quite well here. Uh, also, some of that has to do with the uh, benefits it has received uh, as the supply chain 
dynamics in China got disrupted earlier this year. So yes, Taiwan is getting hurt. Yes, Taiwan is experiencing drags that are going to continue here from the rest of the world. But in a relative sense, I can't think of a country that we are forecasting which is doing better through this event um, than Taiwan. Thanks. Great. Um, so we have one question that's come in through the chat uh, feature. Um, and depending on um, how much time we have left, this may be the last question. But hold on for those journalists who have their hands up. Let's see. Um, the question comes from Manik Mehta. He's a syndicatist journalist in Southeast Asia. His question is, will Asia record the impressive growth rates of the last decade, considering the impact, firstly, of the US-China trade and now of coronavirus? Where do you see rays of hope in Asia? Uh, including China, Japan, India, South Korea, and the ASEAN region. Thank you. So, I mean, it, again, we get into this kind of complicated issue that over the next two or three quarters, I think Asia is going to experience very strong growth from the levels that were depressed as the virus uh, damaged first half performance. But if I smooth out from that and I look at Asia over the course of the next couple of years, I think we have to recognize that Asia is getting hurt by this event. It is following the path broadly of the world, which is you get hit hard, you recover strongly, but your recoveries are incomplete. Um, and that the challenges of high budget deficits, the challenges of dealing with slack labor markets that are not completely utilized, um, and the, um, the broader issues um, around demographics that Asia was dealing with anyway are still in place. I think the other point to make there is it's Asia is a very diverse region. And I think, as I said earlier, Taiwan, both because of its success in dealing with the virus and also because of its product mix, looks well positioned here. I think India has more severe challenges because of these um, heavy burdens and the lack of ability for governments to handle that combined with the social and political pressures that get um, exacerbated by that. China has got its specific issues, which have to do with the ongoing changes going on as a result of the conflict between US-China trade that is morphing in different directions this year, um, plus I think more general um, tensions that are being created uh, both politically and economically with the rest of the world. The ASEAN region is in an interesting position since it's a tech uh, oriented economies and its exports, but it's not generally getting the same benefits from the type of tech activity, which is booming Korea and Taiwan tend to um, be beneficiaries of that. And I could go on on Japan and Korea as, as, as having their own separate issues as well. But I, I would recognize uh, the common factors uh, that generally, if I had to talk about Asia as a region, it's, it's in our mind likely to do better in a relative sense than the rest of the world, but with a lot of diversity and without losing sight of the fact that better in this world still means that you're doing worse than you were before this crisis hit. Mr. Kasman, I know you were almost out of time. Do you have time for one more question? Okay, just one more would be fine. Okay, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Daphne. Uh, Bruce. Uh, perhaps uh, we can a little bit focus on oil-rich countries. How has the crisis affected ordinary people in those countries, such as Azerbaijan and Russia? Have the government's economic policy responses been appropriate? And how will Russian Azeri economies recover? Thank you very much. Alex, please introduce yourself and your outlet. Yes, uh, Alex Rafolu from Tran News Agency of Azerbaijan. So I think, I think, and I have to say, I don't really follow Azerbaijan, so I'm not going to speak about that specifically. But I think we have to distinguish at this point between the effect of what's been happening in global oil markets and the effect of the virus. And I think if you look at the Russian economy right now, primarily what we're seeing in terms of the lockdowns, in terms of the losses and activities, at this point, we're seeing primarily the effects of the virus. And I don't think uh, whether you look at the Gulf states, whether you look at uh, Russia, whether you look at other oil producing countries, including the United States, that the um, the oil dynamic has been the central force. But that, I think, is not to, to, to lessen the important role that oil will play in these economies going forward in terms of um, 
you know, the trade-offs that are being faced in the United States, the very significant credit stresses that are going to come in the oil producing industries, uh, and more generally, uh, what those sectors revenues mean for overall economic growth. So uh, the big call here is where do oil prices go? Um, you know, our own view is that you are seeing now uh, the dynamic of supply starting to respond slowly that is going to start to put some upward pressure on oil prices, but not bring them back in a, in a full-bodied way. Uh, our own forecasts have oil ending this year. Brent at something, I believe, a little bit below $40 a barrel, which is not far from where we are right now. Uh, and if that's the case, pressure on, on budgets in places like Russia and the Gulf states uh, is going to squeeze. I don't think it has been the factor that's driven performance up till now, but it will be a factor that leaves these countries um, in a more difficult position, uh, all else equal, in terms of how uh, the virus dynamic plays itself out. Terrific. Thanks so much. Well, I think that concludes today's briefing. I really appreciate your time, Mr. Kasman, and all, to all the journalists who joined us today. Um, this briefing was on the record, and I will provide a transcript as soon as it's available. Um, immediately following the briefing, I will post the video link um, and reshare the, the uh, chart book that uh, Mr. Kasman forwarded to us earlier today. And with that, I just want to say thank you again for your time, Mr. Kasman, and that concludes today's briefing. Thank you.